Today is August 9th, 2005, and we are in the U Harley Museum, which was begun in 1997, primarily by Mrs. Mary Ellen Nelson Taft, who is with us today to tell us a little bit about the community of U Harley. And I am Jeannie Certain. Well, I'm a native of U Harley and proud to say so. I grew up here. I was born about two or three miles, as we call it, up the creek uh, from the uh, little town of uh, U Harley. And I've loved it ever since I was big enough to know that I loved anything. But I take pride in talking about our history. This, this little community especially, and we had others, they were little cells of groups of people that came from other countries to the New World. And the group that came here to U Harley, which is an Indian, was an Indian name, an Indian settlement, was Scotch-Irish. And they, their love of land uh, is sometimes a past our imagination. They came from a, a land that was overpopulated, starving to death. They couldn't own enough dirt to go in a flower pot. And they thought to come to the new world and have enough land to uh, cultivate and make a living for their family was their idea of finding a pot of gold at the end of the rain. So long in 18, early 1830s, the first people that came here, for the most part, were the Burgess. And they are the ones that built the mill, uh, as we call it, the grist mill, that did both corn and wheat. And we had the McKinleys, the McCarries, the Taylors, the Baileys. They were as Scotch-Irish as they come. And we were all farmers. And in this little cell that we had, and you'll find it was universal in North Georgia in these mountains, the first thing they built, of course, was their homes. And they told me that uh, the trees were so large, This we're talking about virgin timber, something we've never seen, I've never seen. Uh, I might be old, but I'm not that old. It, uh, that they usually, it wasn't architectural beauty, but they'd cut a tree and it was the uh, weight bearing sill of the house. It'd be 40 feet. You'd have a room on either side with a uh, hallway, either dog trot, they used to call them in the mountains, or open hallway, and that they didn't have to piece that timber at all because it was as large where they cut it off at 40 feet uh, as it was at the uh, ground where they cut it from the ground. And they built their homes. They weren't, as I said, architectural beauties, but that wasn't their uh, motive, especially they wanted a, co a home that protected them from the weather. But they had their priorities right. They built their home, and the first thing they built was a church, or two churches in whatever community they was in. Our community had the U Harley Baptist Church and the U Harley Presbyterian Church. And the next most precious thing to them was a school. They d didn't have an education, but their dream of the legacy that they wanted to give to the future generation and to their children was a good education. It wasn't money. They wanted to provide them with a tool to make their living. And you know, uh, you, you don't really understand, and I don't in altogether myself, roads weren't a priority back then. They had schools even in an individual's house if, uh, because they couldn't get from here to yonder. They had to go where they could, and they taught uh, them to read and write. And that was something a lot of them couldn't do when they came here. It wasn't because they were a lower class. They just didn't have the door of opportunity open as we understand it. So when they did that, most of them 
realize that didn't care how uh, large or small a group they were, they had to have some rules to live by. And so they had a little justice of peace, a militia courthouse, some of them did, some of them that, again, they had to use their homes for the uh, militia district. There they tried cases. Uh, and I've always been amused that when we had some school children, they came by here, and I was showing them my first judge. He was in 1837, and he looks like uh, the hanging judge. <laughs> and uh, they said, Miss Taft, what kind of cases did he uh, try? And I said, honey, uh, mostly uh, getting drunk and stealing chickens. Well, that didn't, uh, neither one made an impression while they were right at me. They got across the museum and they turned around and come back and said, what on earth did they steal chickens for? I said, you've never lived in a world where there wasn't money. And there was a period in their, uh, their lives, our early lives, that we didn't have money. We had things. So we, uh, if you want to call it barter, we didn't call it that. We exchanged this for that. And uh, I said, that's what they did. I don't say that all of them uh, took their chickens that they stole and bought groceries as we know it. Uh, they may have bought more liquor for all I know, but that was uh, the answer I gave him. But I want you to know that I lived on a farm. I didn't live back in the beginning, but I lived on the farm for we had mechanization like the tractors. And to me, the tractor made the biggest change in our way of living than anything we've had until we've hit this technology point because it, it, when I was growing up as a girl, the men worked in the field from, I'm really speaking of daylight, I'm not using it lightly, daylight to dark, following a mule or two mules in cultivating or planting or whatever was necessary for the row crops. And it was long, hard, tedious work. And uh, the boys of the family, they usually had large families. We did. I, uh, one of the ladies asked me, what did uh, we do? I said, the boys helped my dad in the field with the row crops, and we helped mother at the house. And, well, what did your mama have to do? I said, honey, if you knew what she didn't have to do, it would make a lot shorter list. I said, you've never lived in the world where we didn't have electricity, we didn't have running water, and we didn't have Walmarts if uh, we needed it. And I said, they had neither. And I said uh, to her, I said, I think that it just liked to shock her. Uh, she couldn't imagine anything more horrible than me telling her my mother cooked each meal from scratch. Well, my mother cooked on a wood heated stove, and we didn't have electricity, so even vegetables did not keep long unless they have a cool place or a cold place to be put. So we grew practically everything that the family would need. Uh, we even, I just say we, I wasn't there but I've heard my mother and uh, her speak of her mother. They wove uh, coverlets out of wool. Uh, they're beautiful. We have a bedspread, as we call it now, uh, over there that was uh, hand-woven from sheep's wool. It's light, but it's very warm. They made these Scotch-Irish women were excellent needle women, and I claim that you can paint a picture with a needle just as easy as you can with oil paints and a brush. And they did beautiful handwork. They made a lot of handmade lace and uh, of different type, crochet and hairpin lace, tatting, you name it. We, the uh, point is that those all were time-consuming things, and they had to do them because you couldn't go to the store and buy it. 
uh, I don't know why we get limited with uh, thinking about something that we can't imagine a world where you can't go to the store and buy lace or buy a ready-made outfit. My mother had to make most of our clothes because you couldn't buy them ready-made. And uh, of course, canning was a long, hard job. That was the only way we had to preserve vegetables for the winter time when we didn't have a garden. And then she had the cow to look after, and she had chickens. She had the eternal washing. And the lady said, didn't she have a washing machine? I said, honey, my mama was the washing machine. And they had to iron uh, with these old heavy irons. Uh, I don't know how much they weighed each, but they were had to be heated on the stove or an open fireplace. And believe you me, at the end of the day, and it usually was about a day's ironing, uh, that because it was permapress hadn't been even dreamed of, the house was hot enough to bake rolls. But we had to do all those things by hand. And we did it in the same 24 hours the good Lord gave us in the beginning. But now we've got all of this new convenience, but we don't have time. When you ask anybody, they certainly haven't got time. But I don't know what we've done with our time. But at any rate, we have rearranged it so that we do only what we want to for the most part. But life was hard back then. There was very little to be done if somebody was sick. Uh, I can remember the heartbreaking thing that uh, my husband's people told me that they had diphtheria. And all of them, uh, of the clan, there was a, a big family of them, uh, connections. Uh, practically the children were getting diphtheria and they were dying just as fast as possible. It just seemed impossible for it to be like that. And uh, one of the ladies had a, a small child, about several months old, and uh, her sister-in-law had a, a child about the same age, and that sister-in-law's child was sick, so she went over to see her. Well, she said when she came home, later they sent word to her that this child had diphtheria and said, I picked up my baby, and I knew that it would be dead in two weeks, and it was. You see, we have gotten so taken for granted that things are there at our fingertips, that we forget that people lived a hard, strenuous, and sometimes heartbreaking life to build the foundation of the existence we have now. Well, you can you just ask the question? Okay. You got it back on. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, can we talk about some of the families that were prominent in the settling, and talk about how the name finally became U Harley. Well, maybe so. Uh, the earliest families that we had here now the. I don't know why history wants to let the Lyras be the pioneers, but they were not the pioneers here. They came later. They bought this mill from the Burgess there, and eventually they, they were as Irish as they come, but uh, they were one of the two biggest landowners in, North, in this part of Bartow County. They owned some 600 acres land, but it wasn't all at U Harley. This was the home place where we are now. Right now where we are, and when I was growing up, was a cow pasture, and this is the building they brought the cows into at night to be milked. And uh, the, uh, then we had the uh, uh, Powells and the Cochrans. They uh, uh, settled at different places, their homes. The Powell and Cochran House still stands. And the Kennedy House still stands, though that's as Irish as you can get, you know. And I, uh, I laughed and asked my dad one time, 
Uh, I'm a, was a Nelson. I said, how did the Nelsons get mixed up with all them Scotch-Irish folks? And he said, honey, said your grandmother was a Bailey, and that's just as Irish as it comes. So we find people. These were people with an inborn a desire to work the land. It wasn't because they weren't educated. They had loved the land with a passion, and the Lyras illustrated it. They were eccentric people. They weren't the most popular. If you had the 10 most popular families, they sure wouldn't head the list. But uh, they took a great pride in owning land, but they didn't care if the buildings got dilapidated or fell in, but don't put your feet on our ground. They were very possessive of that ground. And I might have been too. I talked about other people with limited imagination. And mine is limited too, because I have never lived in a country subjected to the things that they were subjected to and couldn't own anything. I. I still own a farm, I still live on a farm, and I'm surrounded by subdivisions. And I eventually, I imagine it'll go too. But it's been where my life and my heart's been buried in New Harley and in living on a farm, the only life that I've ever known, and it's been totally satisfying to me. Tell us about the New Harley Bridge, the covered bridge. You know, the uh, covered bridge is really younger than any of the buildings that we have here. This, uh, when I was go, I went to school here at U Harley and went to church here. And when I married, I went all of three miles uh, from here. But I've never, did, I don't think I ever took both feet over there. I think I left one foot in U Harley in my heart. I know I did. And, uh, the bridge was, uh, was built in 1886, and all these other buildings, it's been uh, uh, proven that they were built by 1850 and some of them before then. And they were about the same. They looked pretty much the same up in the last year or two that I'd, uh, when I was going to grammar school, and incidentally, we walked to grammar school and to high school uh, it didn't matter how many miles it was, we walked. The roads were impassable even unless you was horseback riding for the most part. Uh, and a good part of the uh, Georgia's notably uh, frigid winters when the ground would thaw and freeze, we called it the bottom fell out of the road. You couldn't go in that Georgia clay. And uh, the uh, uh, churches out here were built, uh, uh, the Presbyterian Church in 1853, and the Baptist Church was built before that time. And I don't know just when the uh, uh, store was built, but I have the uh, uh, account book that my grandfather, when he uh, ran it in 1860. And uh, so, it's been around a long time, and uh, there's very few buildings that have disappeared in my lifetime. It's pretty much the same. It's a little capsule of time or a little part of what I, my, my beloved country, as I call it. It's a park, true enough, but it isn't a manicured like a golf course, and I don't want it like that. And I want it to stay as it is for the future generations to have a visual image of what life was like, even if you want to say 2005, but it was here long before that. They've got something visible, something they can touch, something they can feel, that it, uh, it's important to me where it is to them or not. I think every human being has a right to their heritage, to know it, whether they value it or don't value it. And that's part of our heritage, what I've been talking about, is how we lived from one generation to the next generation. We weren't a moving generation in my time. We are now. 
We've changed our social customs. We lived where Grandpa lived. Grandpa lived where his grandpa lived. In fact, last year was the first year in 150 years the house I was born in wasn't some of my ancestors in it. We weren't a moving uh, people. We stayed put. And we, with this little cell, or as I call it, our commu we call them communities because that's a precious word. That's the people that bound together to make a better a life for the future generation. Uh, that we were bounded on one side by Stylesboro, Taylorsville, Macedonia, and Oak Grove. They were all similar in characteristics and all were building toward this day that we're enjoying now. Quite often you have visitors from other countries as well as other parts of the United States. What are their comments when they come to see this area of the county? Well, I have different ones. Um, the most common one that I have is come from countries that as I call it, it's overpopulated. The green of North Georgia is astounding to them. They cannot believe that there's a place on this green earth is pretty. That's what some of them that couldn't speak English would say to me uh, as a usual thing. That one word they knew was pretty, and the ones that could speak English would be telling me that. We've had them from Portugal, France, Great, a lot of them from Great Britain. And uh, we had, uh, as I think I've told you uh, probably before, uh, a group of, uh, uh, I, I'd call them elite Hispanics. They were tourists. And uh, they had never been in this part of America before. And they were uh, go here from here to the coast. And I, I don't believe that I ran into anybody that was more astounded by the beauty of the nature that we had here. Uh, the trees was uh, fascinating to them. And uh, we had a couple from, uh, I don't know, remember what that college is at, uh, in Hong Kong, Shanghai. Uh, they, uh, well, there were several of them, and only one could speak English, and I said the funny thing to me was she wanted a souvenir. She'd interpret what I'd say to them uh, to go and uh, stop them. At any rate, uh, she would, uh, uh, she finally settled on, we had a metal tag that said covered bridge, and for me, it was ridiculous. I could visualize her riding a bicycle down uh, Shanghai sh Street with that covered bridge tag on it. And I, I would just, I said nobody else thought it was funny, but I have always had the conception that we weren't very important. I loved you, Harley, but I, we were a little wide spot in the road and to think about uh, us having a car tag running around in Shanghai was beyond my imagination. <laughs> the U. Harley Institute was a, uh, in actuality built by the Presbytery, which is the head of the Presbyterian Church. And my dad always called it a college. And I, I've read in some of the old newspapers the curriculum that they had, and uh, I honestly think it was even superior to junior college, the courses that they had of study, and it was a broad spectrum of uh, studies that they had, and it, it was built in uh, 1886, and uh, my from land that uh, my grandfather uh, owned and my father inherited. And it was the pride and joy of you, Harley, to have an institute. I've never known the difference between an institute and an academy. We have two in this area, the Stylesboro Academy, and it was called at one time the Institute. 
and I've never found anybody that could tell me the difference. But this uh, school operated and had dormitor had two dormitories. One of them was used predominantly by the whoever was uh, we called it a professor. You'd call it a superintendent of the school uh, there, and the dormitories were places for non-residents and residents to board and go to school, as I told you before. Roads were impassable most of the time, and the teachers uh, stayed, some of them, there at the dormitories. And it, uh, I don't know how many years it operated as uh, under the Presbyterians' guidance, but eventually it was turned over to the county and it was a county school, and I don't know uh, uh, I get the exact year that it was discontinued in use somewhere around 1950 or 60, and uh, to my sorrow, it was torn down. It was only architecturally beautiful building we had in New Harley, but it seems that Apathy uh, is the uh, enemy of all historic sites. Nobody cares enough to uh, try to make a difference uh, or take a stand to preserve it. And that was a beautiful and a good central point. A, the communities are built around the churches and school. That's the cement that holds people together. And when you lose your school or your churches, you are not a community anymore. You're just a bunch of people. Okay. Several years ago, you were primarily the lead person who developed a book called The History of You Harley. Uh, it's a big red bound book and has a lot of uh, facts and, and photographs in it. Could you tell us how that came about? what um, interesting things happened as you were publishing that book? My sister Emmy's dream was, uh, she always worked toward the betterment, as we'd call it, of U. Harley, but to find somebody that would write the history of U. Harley. And she uh, tried various ones, and she got polite refusals. For the most part, after she died, I tried people. And then I got like the little red hen, I guess. I thought I'd do it myself. But the times that she had even asked me, I was running a farm and I was too busy trying to make a living. Uh, I, I told her I simply didn't have time. And to me, I, I guess I of uh, something moved me for, to realize that if something wasn't done to record our history, it would be lost in the sands of time quickly because it was going away very quickly. And so I started uh, collecting information about the early uh, beginnings of U. Harley, and I did all the research on though that portion of the book. I did not do it on all the families. Most of the families that signed uh, did their own research, but I did own some of them. And it was a long, heartbreaking, discouraging battle. And I've had a lot, uh, I said, I'd look for people, or look for facts, and I just feel like I wasn't ever going to accomplish a complete uh, history of you, Harley. And suddenly the door opened and I'd get uh, information that would uh, give me new life to my energy to get going with it. So I worked on it some four or five years before it was accomplished, but I had a lot of uh, interesting episodes, and most of them i recorded in the book, but I've always loved the one when I chose to find out about the Powell and the Cochran family. There was only a, a cousin left in Atlanta, and they gave me their phone number, someone did, and I called, and this old lady answered, and she, I asked to speak to her sister. 
uh, I was given that sister's name. And she says, well, I'm her sister. But say, she's 102 years old, and I'm 98, and I know everything. So she evidently did. She'd let loose on telling me all the uh, things about the Powers and the Cochrans who were pioneers of this area. And then we had uh, 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 one gentleman that he supported me morally and uh, helped me every way he could to get his own family recorded. And to me, it was a heartbreak that he died of cancer before the book was actually pu published. And that I don't know of any one individual that wanted that book any worse than he did. And I think by his constant telling me that, that, we could, that I could do the book, and that how much he was looking forward to it helped to encourage me and keep me going. Uh, one of the claims to fame of a club in the area is the U Harley Farmers Club. Can you give us some information about it? Yes and no. All at the same time, it was a delay. It's still in existence. But at the beginning, U uh, Harley Farmers Club was organized at uh, um, uh, what we call the Old McGowan Place uh, uh, a long time ago. I'd, I've forgotten what year it was, and it, but it was uh, restricted to 12 farmers. And we didn't have an extension, government extension office like we do now. And this, as I told you, were basically farmers. So each one of them had to have a, something related to a farm life project going that they reported on. And they encouraged one another by finding out new methods of doing things. And one of their meetings that always amused me was uh, they spent the whole day discussing it. They had heard of some newfangled stuff that you put in the row to help plants grow called guana. And you don't know it as guana. You know it as a number of a fertilizer. And they argued practically the whole day where they should buy any, and they finally voted to buy one sack. And I've never heard of them not buying it completely as long as farming was going because North Georgia soils uh, can be depleted mighty quickly because they don't uh, have any depth to them. Along the river is some of the our best uh, uh, agricultural areas. This mountain land, the soil is very thin and it has to have help to produce. And we grew cotton and corn was the main money crop. But uh, uh, Later on, we learned uh, to diversify and grow other things like growing cattle and hogs for market, truck farming, and uh, various other ways to supplement our farm income. One of the things that the U Harley Historical Society is proudest of, and it was at your instigation that we undertook it, was the identification of the Black Pioneer Cemetery between the U Harley Presbyterian and the U Harley Baptist Church. Please tell us about that. Well, I keep saying well, but I do uh, all my life. There's some things you know without being told. And I knew that between the two churches was the, where the black people were buried. We have records of them going attending both churches, and they had no church of their own when this uh, community was first settled. And they put their letters or joined by whatever uh, the church required of, of them and, and up until 1900. And they were buried between the two churches, and I thought it was common knowledge. And uh, so uh, the uh, the in this uh, mania for building things, we have a generation of people that did not know this. And they had planned to build something on, in this cemetery. 
and we as the history club uh, wanted it protected and we did manage to get it that and we put a marker there. Uh, slavery, of course, was here, but slavery wasn't a big issue in North Georgia because most of them had small farms and they had big families and they were, well, uh, they were slaves here as far as that was concerned, but the colored people or the black people that I knew uh, were just like the, uh, their counterparts of the white people just working hard to make a living. We respected them, they respected us, we helped them, they helped us. And I wanted the cemetery to be re remembered and respected and I hope that it always will be because they had a part in building this community the same as we did. The general store in the heart of you, Harley, has been here and has been owned by various families. Can you tell us a little history about the general store? The earliest uh, written record we have, as I spoke a while ago, was of uh, my grandfather's account book in 1860. W.P. Whitesides one time ran it. I don't know how he, that was later, a lot later. But I don't know the different uh, ones that did, but uh, uh, the one in my lifetime was Tom Taylor and his uh, son, Bill Taylor. And uh, he had his store. That was a general store. You could buy anything from a, a horse bridle to a, a what a pair of shoes it was whatever uh, was needed and he had the first gas tank that we had in U Harley uh, we didn't this uh, road was built I can remember when it was being built from here to Rome not the uh, paved one we have but the old road to Rome and we called it a, my dad did called it a pike is the Pike to Rome, and uh, we were oh we were just astounded with these cars. It, it just goes zooming all of thirty or thirty five miles an hour. That was just uh, breathtaking, you know. And dust you wouldn't believe. You would not believe the amount of dust that uh, those automobiles kicked up. Uh, those old ladies used to wear a uh, long light cotton cloak coat if they were going to church or anywhere. Uh, they called them dusters. We call now the only thing we ever protect ourselves is an umbrella and a raincoat. We don't have to fight the dust. But that dust, was, uh, there's no telling. It was like flour in when we'd have a long dry spell. It would boil up till it would just make uh, uh, cover the bushes, the houses, and the air was so full of it you couldn't hardly see anything. This area was uh, settled before the Civil War, but yet it didn't have some of the damage that some other areas had from the Civil War. Is that correct? They, that is true. They came through here from Kingston when they were fighting uh, Sherman thought. Uh, or his officers thought if they destroyed the railroad center of Kingston that they would demoralize Bartow County, which they did. And this wing was coming uh, from Kingston on this side of the river, and then there was another wing on the other side, I've forgotten what general was on that, uh, going toward uh, uh, Atlanta on the other side. But they came through here. They were more or less arrested from a horrible battle over at Kingston. And a tradition or a legend or whatever you want to call it claimed that this big ditch that you see these big trees by going to the creek was uh, uh, formed by their wagons going to the creek for water. They were camped from here, from where the the bridge is all the way up this valley uh, to Harden Bridge Road or beyond. 
there was a huge encampment, and I have uh, some written words of uh, one of the generals that he was camped at U Harley, and the horse that was pulling the uh, uh, cannon, he was going to try to go across the bridge with it, but it was in bad shape. He didn't know where he'd ever make it or not, but he evidently did, because I didn't hear of anybody getting drowned. But they were here, I don't know how many days, and they told me that uh, these were just community uh, bits of history while they were here, that uh, it was cold and rainy, and they didn't have enough tents to uh, our clothes to protect themselves. And they asked my grandmother, could they she sleep under the house? Most of these houses were built well off the ground. And she allowed them to. And as one of them went by, he grabbed her little boy's uh, hat. And that was the only hat he had. And it just broke his heart. And his captain made him give that hat back to the uh, a little boy. But she... They were evidently heavy uh, encampment, especially in this uh, old part of View Harley, because uh, also they said that uh, that well that is it, the old uh, place over there that uh, my grandfather built, was the only time it was a hand dug well, only time it was ever drawn dry. It was a good, strong well. But they were left from here going on towards Stilesboro, New Hope, and Atlanta. But this was more or less a resting place. We didn't have a skirmish here. They had skirmishes a couple of miles on uh, toward Atlanta. The Harley Farm Bureau was an active Farm Bureau through the 40s and 50s and 60s and on into the 70s. Uh, it is known that the idea for the Bartow County water system began with the U Harley Farm Bureau. Can you tell us about that? I hadn't thought of it in a long time, but I, it is true. Uh, a lot of good things were born in New Harley, and that was one that the county appealed to the county, but it was born in New Harley at that Farm Bureau meeting. And they, uh, I've forgotten how they uh, first started. It was a limited amount of people that could uh, uh, be on the water line. And eventually the county took over and uh, formulated the idea on bigger scales. Then it was begun over here. But nevertheless, the beginnings of it, the birth of it, if we want to call it, occurred in U Harley. We had a lot of good things coming from U Harley. U Harley contributed a lot to our society that we can be proud of.